No, I don't think it is. I think it's a, it's a genre, it's a way of doing research that could employ lots of different techniques. The importance, I think, for design research is to contrast it to other approaches. The, uh, one of the main, the traditional instructional systems design that follows an ADI model. And the primary difference is not the iterative processes, but the extent to which the person who is doing the activity is doing it in context and is using the successes and failures of the various iterations to inform theory. And those actually to inform many theories. It can be theories of learning, theories of teaching, theories of design, theories of assessment even. And even as people reflect upon the research that they're doing, theories about how to develop a methodology. So it's, it's far too premature to think about design research as one method or even a set of methods. Joanne Lobato responded a little bit to this today by citing the work of Brenna Ben and Ritland from the 2003 Educational Researcher article. In that uh, framing that she has from an engineer, there are stages from brainstorming through prototyping, definitive trials, implementation, and diffusion. It probably is the case that so far the work in design research has been at the early parts of that model. Paul Cobb's work in statistics is, an ex is a good example because he couldn't find much in the published literature about how children learn statistics, so he had to start somewhere. And an iterative process uh, with some seeding of thought is probably a good way to go. If you think about design research not at the level of a project, but at the level of a program of study, then it certainly can take into consideration the results of randomized trials. So if a randomized trial uh, gives you either a positive or negative result, that's information that can be fed back into a larger design cycle. Similarly, when if you look at Brenda Bannon Ritland's model, it's not just a question of diffusion, which has its own cycles, but also the extent to which a practice that has been adopted over time has enough impact on the practice so that it gets fed back into the brainstorming process for yet another process. So for example, the impact of standardized testing over a period of time on learning can influence the curriculum, which then becomes part of the issue for a new design cycle. As to the question, how is design-based research different than mixed methods, it goes back to the earlier answer that it's not a method, per se. So what you've got in design-based research, as in any research, are claims about how the world is or how the world works. Those claims follow uh, some line of logic and draw upon some data. As to how you go from the data through the conclusion has to do with the method that you use, correlation, randomized trial, participant observation. So what you've got in design-based research are many different claims at many different levels. And if you follow Brenda Van Ritland's model at many different stages, including perhaps randomized trials. So the, the question of the mixed methods is one that responds at a lower level of data and argument rather than being particular, particular to describe design-based research, which is more a paradigm, a genre of approaching research questions. The idea of commissive space comes from speech act theory by uh, Searle. And the, there probably isn't enough time to go into all of speech act theory, but within speech act theory there's a belief that uh, the idea that there's a simple one-to-one -one correspondence between the words we use and the reality out there is very simplistic. That a lot of what we do with language isn't that simple. For example, uh, there are statements like, I do, when somebody is getting married. How exactly that relates to something in the world is an interesting question. And what it suggests, of course, is a commitment. And Cyril would suggest that uh, in all conversations we make commitments. So 
when I said I would show up here, you assumed that I would show up here. Right? When, we, when you ask me a question, uh, let's say, for example, about social responsibility, you have a set of commitments to what that means, and you assume that I do too. And that when I respond, we are, we are sharing those commitments. Otherwise, according to Searle, our conversations couldn't make sense. So the commitments that we share about, say, social responsibility are how we understand design-based research, form a space, a negotiated space, a commissive space. So the commissive is the speech act idea that applies to the sense of commitment in language. So if you look at uh, design-based researchers across all of the various um, examples, you find a commitment to innovation, a commitment to being somewhat radical perhaps, uh, a commitment to creativity, to brainstorming, to prototyping, to um, uh, uh, almost a, a, a pre-decided stance that the, that hard final evidence isn't yet needed, that that's a couple of cycles out, as you might have heard today, again in Brenda Banner Ritland's model. So the, the idea is that a group of researchers become a community of researchers because they share this commissive space, this set of commitments about what constitutes a research question, what constitutes evidence, what constitu constitutes a logic. And that might be compared to the set of commitments that people who do randomized field trials, at least those that grow out of psychology or agricultural science applied to psychological situations, they have a different set of commitments to hypothesis testing, to what makes uh, a data point a data point, to the role of the researcher, to whether or not there's bias involved, uh, a sense that uh, there is a measure which has some uh, implied sense of validity or reliability. And that uh, is another set of commitments. So one might say that the community of those researchers live in a different commissive space. So uh, comparing the uh, commissive space of design researchers with the commissive space, say, of people doing randomized trials, it's easy to see from the perspective of the speech act theory how they could talk by one another. Yet each group feeling vindicated that they're doing science or that they're doing something socially responsible or worthwhile. So that was the suggestion in that paper, is that uh, the debates about qualitative and quantitative research are probably uh, poorly designed because they are, as they are um, being, the arguments are being deployed at the level of method when they should be deployed at the level of the commissive space. Because if they were, then you could see how commitments could be renegotiated to see if you could form a new community between those, for example, who consider themselves to do design-based research and those who are doing randomized trials. And this seems to be the process that occurs when new science is formed, say cognitive neuroscience, for example. At some stage, human beings have to get together and over sometimes a painful period of time, make clear what they mean by the commitments behind the words that they use, not just the dictionary definition of the words, but what's intended by a particular uh, research approach or a data point or what a claim means.